اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه في الأولين وصل وسلم وبارك عليه في الآخرين وصل وسلم وأنعم وأكرم وبارك عليه في الملأ الأعلى إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله ثم الحمد لله الحمد لله الذي بنعمته تتم الصالحات We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we praise him and we are utterly indebted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for gracing us with Islam. Say alhamdulillah for being a Muslim. Say alhamdulillah for salah. Say alhamdulillah for the Quran. Say alhamdulillah for the beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wallahi we are so blessed. Wallahi we are so blessed to be Muslimin. I really, I can't tell you, this Ramadan in particular, as I've been traveling around, I just feel so blessed to be a Muslim. I, I'm, I feel giddy about being a Muslim. Wallahi, wallahi al I mean, I'm, I mean this sincerely. When I see what's happening in the world, and I see the sheer volume of ugliness, and I'm sure you guys watch it every single day on the internet, every day on, on Twitter or X or whatever, on TikTok, it's just, there's so much qubh, there's so much ugliness. When you see endless lies and propaganda, you see endless death and destruction, and then this, there's this weird joy that people get out of harming others. Do you notice this? Like, why are people so happy and excited about causing harm to other people? What an ugliness. You know, it really, and, and, and then I, I say, Alhamdulillah for having Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What a beautiful person to love. What a beautiful person to follow. A man of mercy, a man of compassion, a man of justice. A man who, who cared about a, a tree stump that was weeping because the Prophet was not using it anymore to give the khutbah. Wallahi, he, 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 you know what the Prophet Sallam, when they built the mimbar that he used for his khutbah, the tree stump that he used to use to lean on during the khutbah was weeping. So the Prophet came down, down from the mimbar and he, he soothed, he soothed the tree stump. And he told the companions, you know, if I didn't come down and soothe the tree stump, it would have cried till the day of judgment. That is the prophet we love. That is the prophet we follow. The prophet who was so gentle and kind and loving. The prophet that when he saw a Jewish funeral procession passing in front of him, the Prophet ﷺ stood up and Sayyidina Abu Bakr said, Ya Rasulullah, what are you doing? He said, Alaysat nafsan? Is it not a soul? Is this not a soul that I could have possibly touched? The prophet cared about people. He cared about the welfare of people. لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ نَفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَةً It's almost as if, Ya Rasulullah, you're going to kill yourself, literally, because of how much you care about people being guided to Islam. That's the kind of heart that our beloved Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa had. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُمْ حَرِيصٌ عَلَيْكُمْ you know, it's azizun alayhi ma'anitum. It's heavy for him when you guys are going through hardships, when we're going through difficulties. Harisun alaykum. He's keen for our welfare and our wellness. That's the Prophet we have. And he is light. Wallahi alazim. Allah sent him as nur. Inna arsalnaka shahidan wa mubashiran wa nadira wa da'iyan ila Allahi bi idnihi wa sirajan munir. He is, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a well-lit light source. And he is this beautiful source of light that Allah has bestowed upon us so that we have someone to follow in these times of darkness. And when I say we're in times of darkness, this is not because I'm morose or pessimistic or I'm like saudawi, like I think, you know, in dark terms, no. But unfortunately, we are seeing and observing every day. And it's, it's like on display for the whole world to see, to see all this darkness. So when I, when I say I really am so thankful to Allah to be a Muslim, I mean it. I'm not just saying it. It's not just sheikh talk. Like, wallahi. And, and I hope 
I hope that is the feeling that we all have. You know, like I spoke about in the Khatira, the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bringing throngs of people into Islam, endless amounts of people into Islam, young women on TikTok who are reading the Quran and embracing Islam, Young men, people of all ages, all shapes and sizes and colors and backgrounds break, embracing Islam because they finally, finally found the light and they, they found healing and they found guidance. But you know, I'll tell you something. This makes me think. All these people who are inspired to read the Quran, all of these people who are inspired, who are not Muslim, who are inspired to embrace Islam because of what they're seeing in the world. And it moved their hearts. I have a question for all of us. Has it moved our hearts? Sincerely now. Have we found ourselves as, you know, your, your average standard issue Muslim? That's what we are. Your average standard issue Muslim. Rank and file Muslimin. That's what we are. Have we been motivated to pick up the book of Allah. Why is it that a non-Muslim, atheist, Christian, Jew, whoever, on the internet, is so motivated to go read the Quran, but your rank and file Muslim is not as motivated? We like, we like you know, to talk about, oh, you see all these people embracing Islam, huh? and we like to take some sort of credit for it, but what shifts and change have we made in our connection to the sacred tradition? Have we dug deeper in our connection to Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? These are the hard-hitting questions we have to pose to ourselves. And there's no better time to do that than in Ramadan. I'll tell you what I think are challenges. What I think we're plagued with. You know, in the ninth century of the Hijrah, in the ninth century of the Hijrah, you had a battle called the Battle of, who knows, Battle of, huh? Huh? Badr? No, it's second year. Which, in the ninth year, which battle? Khandaq? No, that's, that's five. Tabuk. The Battle of Tabuk. The Battle of Tabuk was, imagine, after year, year after year, month after month of arduous struggle and hard work, and now, especially after Khandaq, you mentioned Khandaq, and especially after fath Makkah, that community of believers, the majority of them were people who had no means. They had no identifiable resources. They were all effectively poor people, materially speaking. But after many of these battles, the Ummah started to grow in its wealth. So a lot of the companions from the Muhajireen and the Ansar, who historically had no resources, started to have resources. When the Prophet ﷺ called towards Tabuk in the ninth year, a lot of the companions now had established themselves financially. They all had homes for the first time. They all had gardens, families, young families, wives, children. So when the Prophet said, in three days we're going to Tabuk, that was not an easy ask. First off, this is the furthest distance that that community would ever have traveled, 500 kilometers north from Medina. It's a very daunting journey. That's why the Prophet said you have three days to prepare yourself. So, one companion by the name of Ka'b ibn Malik, Sayyidina Ka'b, he was there side by side with the Prophet Sallallahu in all of the major expeditions. When the Prophet came to Tabuk and said, get ready for Tabuk, Sayyidina Ka'b tells us this narration. He says, the Prophet called us and said, get ready for Tabuk. I was sitting in my garden, watching my wife, watching my kids, looking at all the comfort that I finally have, and I'm thinking to myself, no way I have to leave this right now. Like, really? <laughs> you know, like, we've been going through it every single day. Month in, month in, year, month in, month out, year in, year out. 
So he literally is talking about the fact that he really started to enjoy the comforts that he had. What, what anthropologists would call the trappings of excellence. There's things that you develop and that you acquire and that you procure in the dunya that are trappings of excellence. They trap you. I really like my, my bed. Like I only love to sleep on my bed because my bed has a certain thread count my blanket is down feather, 30,000 feather, whatever, blah, blah, blah. It's just, it caresses my skin the perfect way that I like to be caressed. I like my room because it's climatized. I like it not too cold, not too hot. I like this, whatever, the lighting is perfect. We like what we like. And then we, once you develop a liking to something, guess what? You get trapped in it. So people say, oh, I can't use the bathroom anywhere but my bathroom. I can't sleep in any bed but my bed. I can't, ah, uh, tr I get trapped in my luxuries. Sayyidina Kaab, after years of having nothing, he started to get trapped in what he's liking. I like to see my wife. I like to see my young children. I love my garden. I don't want to have to leave this. I find a lot of similarities between us and Sayyidina Kaab. So guess what Sayyidina Kaab, now he knows three days we're leaving. Okay? What do you think Sayyidina Kaab is saying to himself? Guess what he's saying to himself? By the way, he gives this whole narration. He starts doing what we do. I tell you, oh, we have to get up and pray. What do you say? Inshallah. That's what we say. Inshallah, inshallah. I'll, yeah. Hey, get up. It's time for salah. Yeah, yeah, inshallah, inshallah. I'll be right there. He literally started to do that. So he starts to say himself, Khalas, inshallah, tomorrow our st I'll start getting ready to go join the Prophet for the trip. Tomorrow comes. Guess what he says? Inshallah, tomorrow I'll start getting ready. No, Khalas, today is finished. Tomorrow, inshallah. But definitely tomorrow. That's it. I'm going to start preparing myself. This is the second day. The third day, the day the Prophet is now leaving with all the companions. Sayyidina Kaab knows that they're leaving. Guess what he says? Inshallah tomorrow. They'll go now, but inshallah tomorrow I'm definitely going to catch up with them. He gets stuck. He gets trapped in a cycle of inshallah. The Egyptian version of inshallah. You know the Egyptian version of inshallah? There's like the real version of inshallah, like if Allah wills it. And then there's the Egyptian version of inshallah, which is, I mean, I'm never going to do it, but inshallah. Like it's just, it's just something that I use to kick the can down the road. Like I'm never going to actually get to it, but inshallah kind of is a nice way to say, like you make me feel good about myself. Sayyidina Kaab was effectively trapped in his luxury. He liked what he liked. He had what he had. He got trapped in it. And by the way, day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven, 10, 15, 20. He kept on saying, inshallah, until he never made it to Tabuk. And you have to understand, to not fulfill the command of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, which is so direct and deliberate, Get yourself ready. We're all going. This is a huge infraction. It's huge. Earth shattering. But what kept Sayyidina Kaab behind was he was trapped in his, his luxuries. He says in the narration, I kept on saying I'm going to go tomorrow until one day, it's like 20, 30 days in, I look around myself and he's like, the only category of people I see are, number one, the hypocrites. All the people who made excuses for themselves not to go. Like they could have go, but they could have went, but they made excuse not to go. Or the women who are not obligated to go. Or the children. And here I am, a true follower of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, And I'm, I'm surrounded by all these individuals. And all of the men that I should be around in Tabuk, I'm not around them. 
it gets even harder than that. The prophet is in Tabuk. And a few days into their being in Tabuk, the Prophet وسلم, he asks the companions, he says, where is Kaab? You know, that part of the narration really hits me hard. The fact that the Prophet وسلم, would literally be asking about you. Imagine, like your name came to the thought of the Prophet وسلم, and he looked around and he's like, where's Kaab? And Kaab is nowhere to be found. One of the companions, Sayyidina Mus'ab, says something very hurtful. He says to the Prophet ﷺ, That's an expression that translates into, maybe he's in Medina twiddling his thumbs. Like another fil burda is like doing this. Like he's fidgeting. So it's a dismissive type of expression. Like maybe he's in Medina just fidgeting around. So other companions jump up and say, no, 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 Ya Rasulullah. All we know of Sayyidina Ka'b, all we know of Ka'b is that he's a man of dignity. There must be a good excuse. They try to defend him. So now it's 50 days and the battle has ended and the Prophet is returning. Sayyidina Ka'b never made it. Now, Sayyidina Ka'b hears that the Prophet is returning. So what happens? He starts getting real bad anxiety. Oh my God, the Prophet is coming. What am I going to do? So something, as a side note, something you have to understand. Sayyidina Ka'b was a known poet. He was one of the poets of the Prophet ﷺ, Ka'b ibn Malik. And poets of that time, they had a unique standing in society. Poets were usually the ones who were interfacing with the upper echelons, the elite of society. The kings, the viziers, the emissaries. Poets had a unique standing sociopolitically. So he was a known entity. He wasn't some quote unquote low grade, you know, member of society. No, he was a known entity. So his tongue is powerful and it's taken him places in life. So as now he's awaiting the return of the Prophet, ﷺ, he sits with his tribesmen and he starts to figure out what is he going to tell the Prophet. Like, what, what, you know, how am I going to arrange my thoughts in a way to basically effectively exculpate myself? How am I going to convince the Prophet that I'm good? Like, I, I have a good excuse or whatever the case is. So he sits there and he strategizes. The Prophet ﷺ returns. Now, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ was to sit in the masjid. Whenever he would return from travel, he would sit in the Prophet's mosque. And he would take the akhbar, the news. Who do you think are the first people that went to the Prophet ﷺ when he returned? Who do you think? Huh? The hypocrites. Because that's what hypocrites do. They ran to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, Wallahi, we wanted to come, but see, and they have, uh, my family, and this, and I couldn't leave, and blah, 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 excuses, nonsense, excuses, nonsense, and the Prophet knows they're hypocrites. What does the Prophet say? Go, go, go. You're fine. Whatever. He uh, dismisses them. And of course, they walk out and like, we got away with murder. But that's how hypocrites are. Never sincere. Always just trying to pull the wool over people's eyes. Never really wanting to face the facts. As long as they can vindicate themselves, they're good. That's the orientation of a hypocrite. The Prophet uh, Sayyidina Ka'b ibn Malik, it's his turn. And he says, this is a very beautiful long narration, by the way. He sits in front of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He says in the narration, and the Prophet Sallallahu looked at me, وَتَبَسَّمَ تَبَسُّمَ الْغَضْبَانِ You know when someone that you really love and you really respect looks at you with disappointment? That can be the worst look. Like it can be, it, it, no yelling, no screaming, no aggression. It's just, I'm so disappointed in you look. Without even uttering those words. Sayyidina Ka'ab says that's exactly how the Prophet looked at me. Look of deep disappointment. So the Prophet said, go ahead, speak. Sayyidina Ka'ab said, Ya Rasulullah, you know, you, know, you know the tongue that Allah has given me. And I can sit in front of world leaders, I can sit in front of you know, anyone of standing and stature, and I can convince them of anything. But I'll be honest, I sit in front of you right now, and I have, I have no excuse. I have no excuse. I just didn't come. 
That's it. So the Prophet ﷺ says, okay, then go hatta yaqdi Allahu amran kana mafhula. Go until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decrees your affair. I mean, that is a very daunting thing to hear. Imagine the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ telling you, okay, leave the masjid and you have to wait for the hukum, for the ruling from Allah. He leaves, he leaves the Prophet's mosque his tribesmen say, what did you just do? Like, we had this whole story ready. All these hypocrites, look at, like, I mean, they didn't use the word. All these other guys, they got away with it. You could have easily said whatever, and the Prophet would have set you free. Why did you, why, why were you, like, chivalrous and honorable and sincere in this moment? Why didn't you just, you know, try to get away with it? They, they rode him so hard, he started to doubt himself. So he said, is there anyone else like me? Is there anyone else who like sincerely just stayed behind out of weakness? So they said, yes, yes, there's two other companions. Hilal ibn Umayyah and Murara ibn Rabia. These were older companions. So he thought to himself, those are dignified men. Then inshallah, I'm in good company. Meaning like, alhamdulillah, like I, I, I stood firm and I'm facing the heat and I'm dealing with the consequence of my infraction, my weakness, my deficiency. After a few days, the Prophet ﷺ told him and the other two companions, Sayyidina Hilal and Sayyidina Murara, said, okay, the punishment that you're going to have is the following. You are exiled from the community. No salamu alaykum. No one is allowed to look at you. No one is allowed to talk to you. No buying, no selling, nothing. You're officially exiled from the community. Brothers and sisters, I don't think you appreciate how painful that is. You have to understand, this is a very robust community. Like, you know, FOMO, the fear of missing. No one wanted to be away from the Muslim community at that time. That's where it was at. That's where everyone wanted to be. The Muslim community was thriving. It was the place to be in society. Trust me, everyone was clamoring to be in the company of the Prophet and the companions. And to be a young, robust companion like Sayyidina Ka'b, and then to be exiled is the most painful punishment. And of course, there were no limits on this punishment. You're just exiled. Sayyidina Ka'b could not fathom it. He goes to the masjid the first day. He walks into the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine, comes like this. And he says, Assalamu alaikum. Radio silence. No one responds. He goes up to Sayyidina Abu Bakr. Assalamu alaikum. Sayyidina Abu Bakr does not respond. Doesn't even look at him. He goes, Sayyidina Umar, Salamu alaikum. No response. He looks at the Prophet, وسلم, the Prophet looks away. I can't, I, wallahi, I can't even fathom it. I can't even fathom. The Prophet is right there. I'm trying to look at him. The Prophet will not even look at me. That is devastating. May Allah never allow us to be in a situation like that ever. Wallahi. Day one, day two, day three. And he's, he can't believe what's happening. That effectively he's been kicked out of his community. He goes to his best friend's house. His best friend was a companion by the name of Abu Qatada, who also happened to be his cousin. He went to Abu, Abu Qatada was in his own garden. So he goes to Abu Qatada's garden. And he like, looks over the wall and he says, Assalamu alaikum ya Abu Qatada. No response. Assalamu alaikum, Abu Qatada, Assalamu alaikum. No response. Now he's starting to emotionally, like it's really starting to get to him. He said, Unshiduka billah. Ala ta'lam anni uhibbu allaha wa rasulah. Like I, I ask you, I, I ask you to testify in front of Allah. Don't you know I love Allah and his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Abu Qatada doesn't respond. He said, I'm shudaka billah, I'm begging you. I, don't you know, don't you can't, please, don't you testify. Wallahi, I love Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa Abu Qatada turns to him and says, I don't know that. I don't know that you love Allah and his messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That, that broke him in half. That, you know, that was a dagger to his soul. Now, literally, my best friend is questioning and is not certain that I am a lover of Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. 
So now he can't handle being around the community anymore. It just, it's too emotionally challenging. He resorts to just staying in his home. The Prophet Wasallam finds out that Sayyidina Kaab and Sayyidina Hilal and Sayyidina Murara are, are spending time with their wives. So he sends them messengers and he says to them, you're not allowed to be with your wives. So Sayyidina Kaab, he said, does the Prophet want me to divorce my wife? I'll do that. Like this is where he arrived to. Like, does he want me to divorce my wife if that's what he wants? So the Prophet, Prophet was asked, and he said, no, no, no. I'm not saying you divorce her. You just cannot have company with her. No intimacy, no company. So he obliged. Throughout this time, I told you Sayyidina Kaab was a man of standing. He's walking through the marketplace one day, buying some things. A, a, a Nabatean, a Nabati, one of the emissaries from the Christian king, comes, sent by the Christian king, with a letter. Because Sayyidina Kaab was known regionally. He gave him this letter. Sayyidina Kaab opened it, and the letter read from the Christian king, We have come to know of what your so-called friends, uh, those who claim to be your companions, how they're treating you. This is wrong. Come be with us. And I will honor you the way you are deserving of being honored. Now, I want you to pause here. Imagine, in his case, when he was a man of standing, a man of, of dignity and respect in society, and now he's being punished so brutally, being ignored by his community, and being told on that you cannot be with your wife, and all these kind of things. I can imagine that the shaitan was coming and saying, you know what? This is just, this has gone too far. This is not fair. Why, why should I be going through all this? The mistake wasn't that big. Whatever. Any narrative that we tell ourselves. But you know what he did with that letter? He held it and he said, I know exactly what this is. This is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is to assess how sincere am I in my resolve and my commitment to fix the mistake that I made. Because I made a huge mistake. So he took the letter, he tore it up, and he burned it. Fast forward, it's the 50th day of this exile. How long was the Battle of Tabuk? 50 days. On the 50th day, he's sitting in his home because he could no longer pray in the community. And he was praying Salatul Fajr. He's in sujood, he comes out, he hears people running. Ya Kaab! Ya Kaab! Liyahna Ya Kaab! Like, Ya Kaab, Ya Kaab, be joyous, Ya Kaab, rejoice, Ya Kaab. So he jumps up and he's alone. He's been alone for days. And he runs down and he says, What's going on? He says, Come, come, the Prophet, وسلم, this is, come, come, come with us. The great news has come. So he was so excited for the first time he's dealing with his brothers in all these days. He takes whatever, he takes his garment off and he gives it to them as a gift. He's so excited. He doesn't know what to do with himself. Here, here, come, take this. Like, just, he, he has no idea what's happening. So he's running with them. He goes to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is the first day that, in first time in 50 days, he walks in and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is looking right at him. And he says to him, sit down, Ya Kaab. This is the best day of your life. This is the best day of your life. لَقَدْ تَابَ اللَّهُ عَلَيْكَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forgiven you. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down verses from the Qur'an just for you. وَعَلَى الثَّلَاثَةِ الَّذِينَ خُلِّفُوا حَتَّى إِذَا ضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَرْضُ بِمَا رَحُبَتْ وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ وَظَنُّوا أَنْ لَا مَلْجَأَ مِنَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا إِلَيْهِ that upon the three who stayed behind, until they felt and experienced that this vast world that was so open to them had become so small. وَضَاقَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنفُسُهُمْ And their own nufus, their own hearts had become so tight. Imagine, you had this big, vast, open world, and now you've become so constricted. The world of Sayyidina Kaab had become infinitesimally small. 
But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says something very powerful. And they knew with certainty that there was no recourse from Allah except to Allah. Brothers and sisters, what Sayyidina Ka'ab knew with certainty is that the only recourse he had was to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I made a big mistake. I wronged myself. Rabbi zalamtu nafsi. I oppressed myself. And I know that the only recourse I have is to you. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter the punishment that I have to go through. Doesn't matter that I have to eat dirt. Doesn't matter that people are going to exile me. Doesn't matter that I'm going to be tantalized by all these fitan, people trying letters and whatever. I know that my only recourse, my only salvation is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's what Sayyidina Ka'ab knew. His infraction was big. It was huge. His mistake was gargantuan. But what you see in the story of Sayyidina Ka'ab was a man of dignity, a man of strength, a man of sincerity, a man of resolve, and a man of courage. Because it takes courage to do what Sayyidina Ka'ab did. To stand tall and firm and to own up to his mistake. He owned it. He didn't make excuses for himself. You know what we do today? All we do all night and day is make excuses for ourselves. Woe to me. Oh, this happened because of one, two, three, four. We're ready with our list of excuses of why we do what we do, of why we make mistakes. We pass off the buck to someone else. It's mommy's fault. It's daddy's fault. It's society's fault. It's this fault. We have a list of people and places and things that we're ready to blame for our mess up, for our shortcomings. It's not dignified. It's not. It's not honorable. It's not chivalrous. It's not courageous. It's weak. We have to own up to the fact, brothers and sisters, that you and I, you and I, we've become trapped by our luxuries. We've become trapped by our indulgences. We've become trapped by our feelings. Too many of us, and please open up your heart to me, too many of us are trapped in ourselves. Because our whole narrative, day in and day out, is what I think, what I feel, what I want, what I desire, what I think I'm entitled to, what I think I'm owed, how I think I have been wronged, how everyone doesn't do this, how everyone doesn't do that, how come you don't treat me this, how come you don't give me that, how come it's all a big, exaggerated, bloated narrative about myself. And the only one who's trapped myself in myself is me. Sayyid Nakab, he owned it. I was the one trapped by my garden, by my feelings, by my likes, by seeing my kids. I was trapped in myself. And the only way he could liberate himself, and they knew with certainty there's no recourse except to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah says, Taba alayhim liyatubu. What does that mean? That means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they knew, and this is what you have to understand, when we know with certainty that our only refuge is Allah, our only recourse is Allah, then Allah opens up a door of tawbah. He opens up, opens up a door of return so that you turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You come back to him with humility, with inkisar, with the brokenness. You come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in loving surrender. You come back to Allah with nadam, with regret. You come back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with faqr and iftiqar, impoverishment and neediness. The door of Allah is now open to you. What Sayyidina Ka'ab did was the following. A door was opened from Allah and what did he do? He walked through that door. Was it easy? No. It was hard work. He was resolute. He did what it took to fix the mistake. 
You know what our problem is? We're not ready to do what it takes. We're not. We want it easy. Effectively, what we say is this. I already said I'm sorry. You just murdered my kid. Sorry doesn't cut it, Habibi. You know what I mean? Like, you create, I did a big mistake. Just to say, oh, Allah, I said I'm sorry. That should be enough. That's not how it works. You have to actually now earn it. You have to earn your repentance. You have to earn forgiveness. You have to work for it. By the way, Allah is very forgiving. He's very merciful. He will make it that he will fast track your repentance. And Allah's mercy is vast. But you can't do the following. I can't say, oh no, I've made mistakes, but I made dua once and it didn't really work. Or I've made mistakes and yeah, I picked up the Quran, but I didn't really feel it, so I put it back down. Yeah, I know I've been making mistakes, but I came and I prayed and it was exhausting and tiring, so I just went back and sat on my phone. Those excuses that we make for ourselves, those are what are devastating us. Do you know what happens when you stay the course and you're resilient and you're strong and you're committed and you're courageous and brave? You literally get revelation sent down about you. That's what Sayyidina Kaab got. Sayyidina Kaab, after a huge infraction like the one he made, when he was strong and resolute and committed to the process of repentance, Allah literally sent down revelation in his honor, consecrated until today. That infraction became the source of his wilaya, the source of his elevation in ranks. Wallahi al-Azim, all of us sitting here today, we may have disasters in our closet. A haram relationship with a boy, a haram relationship with a girl, filth that I'm looking on at the internet. Whatever it is, and we all know our stuff, and we all have demons in our closets. You have one or two options. Either you look at those infractions and you say, this is, this is my destiny, I'm a loser, I'm a failure, I'm worthless, I'm this. I tried, it doesn't work. I'm not, I'm not cut out to be a true servant of Allah. I'm just too weak. You can either tell yourself that sob story, that's very self-indulgent. Because it is. It's a very self-indulgent story. You know, Sheikh, I'm just a failure. Yeah, Habibi. What, do you want me to cry for you? No, you're not. That's loser talk. That's just self-indulgent talk. I'm sorry. I don't mean to be harsh, but I mean it. No, 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 no. No one's a failure. Trust me. The infractions that the companions of the Messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made, some of them were huge. Huge. The difference is that they're already willing to put in the hard work to make right their wrongs, to fix their mistakes. I want us to realize this month of Ramadan, this particular month of Ramadan, has to be a month where you and I, we grow up and we face the facts. We face reality. We deal with our problems and we take them bulls by the horn and deal with it and fix our problems because Allah is the one who has our back. Allah is the one cheering us on. Allah is the one who wants us to be better. That's why, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي and if my servants ask you about me, I am close. I respond to the call of the caller if he or she calls. If you and I have a sincere moment, what is known as Sidqu Tawajju Allah, a sincere moment of turning to Allah and say, Ya Rabbi, I'm sick and tired of being in my fields all the time. I'm sick and tired of talking about myself all the time. I'm sick and tired of self-loathing. I'm sick and tired of licking my wounds every night and every day. 
Ya Rabbi, all I've been doing for the past year, two years, ten years, is thinking about what I think I'm entitled to, and what I'm owed, and what I should have. By now I should be married. How come no one loves me? How come this? How come that? We all have these stories that we're trapped in, by the way. Those are the prisons of the modern people. We're trapped in these stories of what we think we're owed, what we think we should deserve, what we think people should, we're, we're entitled to from people. Isn't it time that we just turn to Allah and we say, Ya Rabbi, liberate me from myself? This self of mine has destroyed me. Ya Rabbi, give me a Sayyidina Ka'ab moment where I have Sidq al-Tawajjuh and I know with certainty that my only refuge is you, Ya Rabbi. Now that in this Ramadan you've opened up a door of Tawbah, a door of return, please let me walk through that door. Please let me return to you, Ya Allah. Help me, Ya Allah. I'm a weak, broken, humble servant of yours. I'm sick and tired of being the way I've been. Ya Rabbi, I can't stand myself, let alone other people dealing with me. But trust me, you know that you can't stand yourself. Admit it. Admit it. It's true. You know it. I can, who, stand, who can tolerate themselves? I'm sick and tired of just my mind. I'm sick and tired of my thoughts. It's harmful. It's hurtful. There's no more injurious place than here. So why not liberate ourselves? Do you know why the people of Palestine, the brothers and sisters of Gaza, those children, those men and women, those innocent, beautiful souls, do you know why you, when you look at them, and you can all attest to this, not just all of you, wallahi, the whole world can attest to what I'm about to say. Whenever you look at someone from Palestine, what do you see in those people's faces? Wallahi, you see a wealth of honor and dignity. You see so much power and strength. You see so much confidence. You see so much beauty in their faces of all ages. Do you know why you see so much beauty in their faces? You know why you see so much strength? You know why all those non-Muslims are rushing to read the Qur'an when they just literally look at the faces of the people of Palestine and Gaza? Do you know why? Because they're not seeing people who are stuck in themselves. They are seeing people who have fully and categorically put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're fully in a state of loving surrender to Allah. Wallahi, all these women that I watch on the internet in Palestine, when they come on the cameras and they're saying, we don't need anyone, we have Allah. They took all of our children, they took all of our spouses, they took all of our men, they took everyone, but we have Allah. Wallahi, it sends shivers down my spine because I know I'm looking at a woman of profound dignity and profound honor, something that we are not. Wallahi, when I look at some of these women and these children, I say, we are not that. We are not like them. We're not. Because we're so stuck in ourselves. We're so stuck in our weak desires. They're not. They've been liberated. They've been free. Wallahi azim. That's why Allah chose them. Allah chose the people of Palestine. He chose them. That's why through the people of Palestine, those women and children, those young men, those old men, old women, Allah is bringing scores of people into Islam just by observing them. How can it be that we're here and we're seeing all of this and we're still stuck in our feelings? We're still stuck in ourselves and our, our, our entitlement. It just doesn't add up. We need, we need a moment of sincerity. And I hope this Ramadan, I hope this Ramadan is a sincere moment for us all to shift gears. Stop thinking about yourself so much. Stop. Wallahi. Stop thinking. You're not, the world does not revolve around you. You're causing yourself harm and you're causing everyone around you a lot of harm. Stop thinking about yourself. Only think about Allah and His Messenger. Turn back to Allah tonight. Make it a moment. Ya Rabbi, I'm turning back to you. I'm, it's over. Khalas. I'm shifting course. Now, I really want to be an inheritor of Sayyidina Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I want to be a person of the Quran.
I want to be a beacon of light in this world. Ya Rabbi, guide me and guide through me and allow me to be a cause of guidance for others. Ya Rabbi, I want to be well guided. This Ramadan, you know what? I'll tell you, the majority of us, you know what the bar of our dua is? Ya, this is effectively the bar of our dua. Ya Rabbi, give me the things I want. Really? Really? Is that all, is that all we have? Is that all that we can ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for? Just the things that I want? I'm not saying it's wrong to ask Allah for what you want, by the way. But that's such a low bar. Mashi, fine. Ask Allah for the things that you want. Whatever it is, it's fine. But up your game. Because guess what? You know what? Like I said in the khatira, humanity needs us. Humanity needs the community of believers to wake up and to be present and to purify their hearts and souls. Wallahi, like I said in the khatira, maybe you're a lazy bum today. You don't want to get up and pray. But you know what? With the niyyah and the intention to not see any of your brothers and sisters in, Pal in Palestine or in India or in Sudan suffer anymore, you're going to get up and pray two more raka'at. Maybe I don't feel like getting up and reading a few more pages of the Qur'an, but to bring some rahmah into this world and to lift this evil that is upon the world, I will get up and I will read more Qur'an for the sake of the ummah, for the sake of humanity. Then now I'm going to up my game in a way where I have a higher standard. A higher standard of ubudiyah, of servanthood. May Allah liberate us from ourselves. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to be beautiful servants who all that we have orbiting in our hearts and minds is the beauty of La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. May Allah give us the strength and the resilience and the courage and the chivalry and the honor of Sayyidina Ka'ab to be like him, to have a sincere moment of tawbah and rujua ila Allah, return to Allah, to have sidqut tawajjuh ila Allah, May Allah alter and orient our lives drastically in this moment. May He create in our minds and our hearts a cosmic shift in how we think about everything. I pray that we, we turn to Allah tonight and that this is a sacred moment because this Ramadan, Wallahi, is not a normal Ramadan. It's not. This is a very special Ramadan. And there are very special things happening in the world around us in the seen realm, and more profoundly in the unseen realm. We need to plug into that orbit. May Allah allow us to bask in that sacred orbit. Allahumma ameen. Barakallahu feekum wa jazakumullah khair.